just ask that everyone silence your phone because it's super disruptive. And uh, let's give them a hand. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the first time I've been in the public market. I live in Vermont. Um, our public market is the <laughs> farmer's market. Um, this is fabulous to see what's going on here. Um, and I really celebrate the trustees' decision to put something like this in downtown Boston. Um, I want to talk a little bit. So you've got a plate in front of you. We are going to eat everything that's on the plate, but not just yet. Uh, I like to eat. I am not a farmer. I'm not a chef. I don't even consider myself a food professional. I am what I want to call a food enthusiast. If any of you use the word foodie, not in this room. It is uh, verboten. Please don't use that word. I find it offensive to people who must like good food. Whatever it is. And that includes greasy spoon diners. Um, I did a book on cheese. Just finished this new book on dry cured meat. I am a real fan of fermentation. In my opinion, the renaissance of fermentation in the US is something we all should be celebrating and supporting. And it goes back to wine and beer in the 1970s, to the explosion. How many of you know how many beer breweries were in the States about 1980? Anybody? There were 80 breweries. Anybody know how many there are today? Between 55 and 5,600. Unbelievable. Cheesemakers, um, kombucha, hard cider, real hard cider, mead, all kinds of amazing foods and beverages. And there is now this drive towards uh, understanding and producing great cured meat. Every one of the things that is going on here today is a reason why we there's anybody know the reason why we created these in the first place? Preservation. Absolutely. Pre preservation and survival. Hey, they also tasted pretty good. Some of them were alcoholic. Hey, I could, I could have a really good time surviving. Um, a lot of these techniques come to the States in the late 19th, early 20th century. Some of them were even earlier. Native Americans, by the way, cannot ignore what they did for food preservation. Um, in the Andes, the Quicha. How many of you are hikers? You ever carry trail mix or uh, freeze-dried stuff? Or yeah. A recent technology, eh? No. The Quicha were freeze-drying food 3,000 years ago in the Andes. So when we think that all of this is brand new and we should be jumping up and down because of such great creative people, yes, but we have long histories around these foods. And what we see, and I think both the public market and this festival, is a way to highlight those people who are looking to make a living with beneficial microbes. And this t-shirt happens to be from um, old ways with their cheese of choice coalition. Carlo Petrini, who is the founder and president of Slow Food International, when I met him many years ago, he, and he says, you know, we need an international society for the preservation of good microbes. We really do. And I said, Carlo, you need to make a t-shirt like that. I'll wear it. Um, those techniques come to the states. Hogs are what drives the growth of America until the Second World War. You and I think of John, John Wayne and, you know, we got to get the cattle to Wichita. Yeah, they did, but that's not what drove our expansion. In terms of protein, it was pork. And I had to figure out how to preserve it. And so, among other things, country hams. Salamis, not so much. We ate those fresh. Or there are other techniques in places like Louisiana where they basically cook that salami and then layer it in a crock and cover it with lard. Now you and I think, ah, oh, man, that's 
sound pretty fatty, yes, unless you're hungry. And then it's mighty good, and it stays that way. In Italy, olive oil was, if you could afford it, would be the thing that helped to preserve some of those cooked meats. We also did things like terrines and pâtés. When you think about French charcuterie, those are cooked products. Making a salami is about fermentation. Principally lactobacillus, microbes, various types that actually ferment inside that casing. There are three principal things that we have to pay attention to when it comes to dry curing a salami or a whole muscle, and I'll talk about that in a minute, in a moment. What are the three critical factors, anyone? Salt. Say again. Salt. Salt is one, absolutely essential. Why? Any idea why? Salt pulls moisture out, and Fred knows unbeneficial, non-beneficial microbes destroys them. That's one. What else? Sir? Time. Time. Time, yes, but there are things going on time contributes to. One is, go ahead, say again. Acidity. Acidity is another one. That's the second. Acid. As they ferment, they create an acid. Microbes don't particularly, all of the, especially pathogenic uh, microbes don't like acid. And the last one is water activity. So the drier, not a conducive environment for the growth of bad microbes. You and I didn't know anything about the science. What we knew is that certain practices um, created great tasting food and food that would last. Um, we don't know about, the, about what's going on in those meats until the mid-19th century. What would have been the change? Anyone? Canning? Not canning, because that's cooked. Refrigeration? Say again. Refrigeration. Refrigeration's a little bit later, and not everybody could afford it. Pasteurization, Louis Pasteur, who's invited by a group of brewers to come in to figure out what the hell's going on with my beer, it keeps spoiling. And he figures out what's going on and then says, just heat it. It'll kill those bad bacteria that you don't want in your beer. It works, and still, whether you are a fan of pasteurization or you're not, it is one of those techniques that extended shelf life, that made things sometimes safer. Uh, sometimes it does have um, not beneficial results, like killing off some really good stuff. But pasteurization is essential to a number of foods and beverages that we drink. Whole muscle does not ferment. When you and I think of food illness outbreaks in this country, does anything come to mind? <coughs> and, say again. Salad bar, yeah, there's another one. I'm thinking about proteins in this case. And what? No. And? Cheese. Ground beef, much, much more risky than well-made cheese, to say the least. One animal can contaminate a half a million pounds of ground beef, one animal, and then we all get sick. What's the difference between that and that whole muscle? Where's the risk factor? Say again. The surface, yes. The inside's sterile. So we learn salting techniques to help salt penetrate the muscle, the exposed flesh, and then to penetrate the skin. So country hams. Country hams were put up in the south from day one. Food preservation, food that I needed to have through the winter time. Using smoke, but salt, Sometimes they use borax on the outside in order to keep the flies off. The Italians have something called sunya. It's a mixture to, of uh, fat and other ingredients to keep the bugs from essentially laying eggs in the meat. 
techniques that are learned over centuries. Those techniques last here in the States. And um, one of the things that I am amazed with is even though, I'm just checking time. I don't want to. Oh, you're doing good. I'm doing good? OK. Um, one of the things that we lose, essentially after the Second World War, are all of these people doing these great foods. In part, because we shift from small-scale production to commodity and industrial production, where everything has to be uh, pasteurized or cooked. So most of the stuff that you and I have access to, even in reasonably good markets, if you look at the labels, they say cooked. They don't say raw. How many of you buy bacon that's labeled uncured? Why? Why do you buy bacon that says uncured? <laughs> OK, that's a good answer. Why does somebody else buy uncured bacon? Nitrates. Nitrates. What does it say, though, in the little asterisk under that little flag that says uncured? Anybody ever read it? Naturally occurring what? Celery salt. Guess what? How many of you, well, probably no one here is a vegetarian, because you're here to eat meat. <laughs> but if you have friends who are vegetarian, and there's very, very important reasons why we eat like this, um, do you realize that in something like celery, spinach, a whole bunch of green vegetables, that your ingestion of nitrates on a daily basis is far greater than anything you're going to eat today. It's naturally occurring. That is not a way for, that the uh, producers are trying to get you and me to buy something that we think is healthier for us. This is a federal regulation. If you use synthetic nitrates or nitrites, the feds say you have to label it as cured. But if you use naturally occurring, it's now uncured. It's exactly the same process. It's actually where the way I would define cured, it's safe because there are nitrates in that celery or sea salt. There are other things that people can add into it that are safe and <coughs> natural. Uh, there is a company out of um, Virginia you pick up their salamis, and it doesn't say cured or uncured. All it says is we add natural ingredients, sea salt, celery salt. And because they label it like that, they get around this question of, geez, isn't there are nitrates in there? The answer is, yes, there is. So you and I actually create nitrates in our bodies, very small amount. And one of the things that I talk about in this book is this question of cured and uncured. Because I think, as a consumer, some of you are probably confused listening to me say this, that it's not helpful on the part of the federal government to that kind of designation. But it's there. Post-World War II. A lot of this stuff disappears. But there are people who hang on. And one of the things that occurs that changes the way in which we eat is the arrival in the 90s of small scale meat growers who were looking for markets. But you and I can't afford just to buy the chops or the loins or the legs. Somebody said, well, why don't you learn how to break down a whole carcass. And so with lamb and goat and hogs and beef, we start learning how to break down a whole carcass. But I can't use all of that carcass for um, everything that I might want to make. I can make fresh sausage from that, but there's still some stuff left over. And so some of the first experiments, and I want to use that word 
in a in a neutral way. Some of those first experiments are to figure out how to take things that they might not be able to use and get value from it. Bacon is the first thing that we start seeing chefs making on site. And a handful of people are playing around with uh, fresh uh, sausage and then maybe some cured stuff. Oh, maybe I could make a prosciutto or what the Italians would call coca, which is the neck. Uh, or lonzo, the, or lomo, two different words for the same loin of the animal and curing that. And they start to get people interested in, maybe I could cure. Maybe I can take some of these things and expand out what I'm doing and in my production. So what we have, and in New England there are a handful, one of which is Moody's Deli, New England Charcuterie. They're the ones who are providing the food that we're going to taste in a couple of minutes. They um, started off very small. Uh, those of you who were in the uh, Moody's on, in Waltham, little tiny space, you got somebody to help. Um, you know, somebody came in and said, I'll help underwrite your, what you're doing. And now they have a brand new facility, um, a few, I don't know if it's how close, but much larger facility for their curing operation. This requires resources. It's not something you can sort of do um, by the seat of your pants. It really requires some resources. If I am making charcuterie and I want to sell it direct to you, the only people who inspect me are, if I live in Boston, would be the Department of Health. But if I want to sell it to somebody on the other side of the state so that they could sell it in their shop, no longer inspected by the Department of Health, I'm now inspected by USDA. And one of the challenges has been to educate our public health inspectors and our USDA inspectors about what this process is uh, doing and why the food is safe. So what we have from Moody's, and I want you to, there's a very dark, they look a little bit like leaves, if this one right here, I want you to put that to the right of you. For those of you who still use a watch, three o'clock, for those of you who use a cell phone, forget it. <laughs> you didn't get one. Do we have any more plates? Oh, yeah. Do we? How does it, who does not have a plate? There are two here. And we have plenty of, uh, for those of you who may have just come in. We need those. I ate one. I ate one. You ate yours. <laughs> uh, this costs extra. Um, Go ahead. We do have a handful left. So we're going to start. Oh, sure. In the back. Make sure everyone has one. Oh, no, we played the one. Sure. Yes. I think they made some. There's one more. If I, I did say don't eat them. This cost you, by the way. You, if you put a 50-cent piece in the donation box, it's now up to five bucks to get out of here. Um, support Boston Ferments. So the one at the top, and some of you might notice, first of all, I want you to look at it. Look at the... First, the color, look at the, actually the pattern. You see small bits of fat mixed into meat. This salami, generally uh, these are 80% meat and 20% fat. To make it, you have to chill the fat, otherwise when it gets warm, it gets very greasy and smears. So you chill the fat so you get these nice chunks. You might notice something else in there kind of yellow. Anybody know what that is? Fennel seed. This is a very traditional Italian recipe using wild fennel seeds as their flavoring and then just inhale. And for me, what do you guys smell when you smell besides fennel? I smell pork. <laughs> this is important because we're going to taste a few that are a little spicier a little bit later in the, in the tasting. You want to smell and then taste pork 
because what's happened over the last, especially in the last 15 years, is the submergence of extraordinary pastured pork. Why did I use that word and not grass-fed? Anybody know? Hogs can't survive on grass. They are not ruminants. They are like you and me. They have one stomach, which means they can eat anything, like nuts, which puts fat on them as if there was no tomorrow. Unbelievable. And that's how they were often fattened up. So the Spanish jamones, the ones that come from uh, the Spanish Iberico uh, jamon, those animals are fattened on acorns. And it's a process that goes back several hundred years. What do you think? Yes, it is. It is. By the way, the booth is outside if any of you want to buy some of this. That's my last commercial. Um, <laughs> but this is what it looks like. Um, large format. Now there's a little, what I pick up in this is a little more salt for me on the back of my throat as the aftertaste. And there's literally an infinite number of ways that this can be made. Um, and keep something in mind, as these are fermenting and drying, so someone earlier said that drying is very important, it loses weight. And the drying is essential. So when it loses weight, I am concentrating flavor. I'm concentrating fat. It's the same way that with a really beautiful, well-aged Parmigiano Reggiano or a great cheddar, those, you begin to pick up crystals as that thing ages. That's because it's lost moisture. And they get denser. They also get a lot more expensive because I started off with a 20 pound, and after three years, it's now 15 pounds. I got to make up that time I sat on the shelf. Same thing is true with salami and um, whole muscle cured meats. What I am still tasting. Yes, go ahead with questions. Is there like a, an ideal temperature at which? Oh, great. Kind of depend on you know, the, the type of meat or how much fat is in it. All of the above. Plus, are you trying to do a fast or a slow fermentation? So a lot of the commercial stuff that you and I see, they add a lactic starter rather than let the lactic bacillus start on its own. They add a lactic starter and it's at a much higher temperature. So it bangs right through the fermentation process. It also boosts the acid. So you can taste the acid in some of these. Um, and that's in part because of how it's been fermented. There are a handful of producers who are working with naturally from, uh, occurring microbes. And they do this, they've, got to, they've gone through USDA review. There's one company in New York, Salamaria Belezi. It's They spend $100,000 to have somebody test because the FD, the USDA said you can't do that and they said this is safe prove it so the guy they they did all of this the, the lab person injects them with a a load of uh, pathogens that you and I would run away from and after it had um, finished its drying he tested it found nothing absolutely amazing. And, US, and USDA said, well, you know, this is our guy. I guess we're going to have to work with these results. I had saw a hand up, sir. Yes. Besides the flavoring that found here, is that all aid in the fermentation? No, it doesn't. It shouldn't. There are instances in which the addition of black pepper has knocked out some cheeses because the pepper had some microorganisms on it that were not wanted in the make. And so it created a process that people didn't, it ruined the cheese, essentially. The next one, absolutely beautiful. Anybody know what I've got in my hand? You may have looked at the sign up here. This is beef. This is brizala. 
what I want to point out to you, since this is whole muscle, is the marbling, what's what we call the intermuscular uh, fat that's throughout this muscle. As it ages and, the, and it changes, and I should have said earlier, whole muscle, I said, doesn't ferment. It's an enzymatic process inside the muscle. The salt penetrates, the enzymes go to work on the muscle and the fat and convert this into something that has staying power and is damn delicious. So, oh, and I should say about this, I'm not sure where they're sourcing this. Any of you have heard of Kobe beef? Any of you eaten it? Pretty expensive stuff. The breed of cow is called the Wagyu, or steer. Uh, they're now in the States, not Kobe, but, but Wagyu. And this is a Wagyu steer, Brazala. And they're selling this outside as well. Was it originally made from the Japanese or the Italian the Japanese breed? Oh, yeah. This is a Japanese breed. Right, but traditional, 100 years ago. Well, they, there are any number of steers in Italy that could have been used. The Chianina uh, is one. And this would normally be a northern Italian uh, curing because we don't find that, in, first of all, we don't find that many steers up north, uh, in the south. And the ones that you had, you weren't slaughtering until you absolutely had to because they were your draft animals. Um, in that area of Friuli that bumps up <coughs> against Slovenia and Austria, you get something called speck, which could be either pork or beef, and that's also smoked, in part because the environment doesn't necessarily allow me to do a dry cure. Does that make sense? Yep. By the way, this is all about how you and I learn to work with what nature gives or doesn't give us. And in Italy, cold winds, dry winds, blowing in and, in and out of my caves, and then when I actually build a building, that works. In Germany, not so easy. Um, and there's one company that I'm aware of in the States, old company, that is still doing what I would call artisan German uh, worsts, including something called Lachschenken, L-A-C-K-S, or, or L-A-C-K, L-A-C-H-S, lotch, or lox. And it looks like salmon in the color. But it's, they call it salmon ham. Mm. And it is a knockout. Schaller and Weber in Manhattan. And if you get to New York, get on the Second Avenue, New Second Avenue subway, get off at 86th Street, and it's right there. And you won't want to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's a super question. Diet? I can take a great animal with the fabulous genetics and not feed it well, and I'm not going to have the best quality. Um, here's the other side to your question. Until the Second World War, we're really not genetically manipulating our animals to the point where there's nothing about them that's worth eating, like the commodity hog like the Holstein, which is our milk spigot. And they're bred to blow out as much milk as they can, and those, uh, those uh, cows have two lactation cycles, and then they go to the glue factory. That's it. It's a terrible, in my opinion, a terrible way for us to eat, and a terrible way for us to think about food animals. So Part of the answer to your question is I had to learn to work with whatever animals I had on my farm. Um, and we did. Uh, we also begin, we also, before I know anything about genetics, remember genetic and, uh, breakthroughs don't happen until the late 19th century. But I'm crossbreeding animals all the time, looking for yield, uh, looking for size, looking for any number of qualities. And um, that changes how you and I were eating. Number three, 
Yeah. Got it. Number three. This is a very uniquely flavored, they call it maple togarashi. So it has, and I've got to look at this label. And I'm going to just pull this label off for a second so I can. So it's got maple syrup. By the way, and if this is in water, obviously pork is first. Maple syrup is second. Salt, tahini. What? Tahini. Less than 1% of the following. Orange zest, Korean chili, ginger, nori, Sichuan peppercorns, garlic, lactic acid starter. Now, Josh Smith is using a starter so he can advance his process. By the way, the other reason for using a lactic starter is so I can have a little more standard uh, product. So the product that I did today can be the same as the product they do tomorrow, rather than maybe something going wrong with what nature gave me. Um, he adds, this is cured. So this says nitrates and nitrites on the label. Um, haven't tasted this before. So good. So good. <laughs> okay. The orange. The orange. You can taste it. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I can't do. Is it great? What do you guys think? Smell the ginger. So good. Smell yeah. the ginger. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I can. Yeah. <laughs> I know what I was going to write. Do you have an opinion on the health of nitrates naturally versus unnatural, like synthetic? Do you have an opinion? Um, well, I said earlier. I mean, you talked about what the difference was, but there's no difference. It's exactly the same. Do you don't think same. your body registers it in a different way? If you're over, listen, in my opinion, if you can, you can overeat anything and your body's going to re react. Um, you know, Michael Pollan said, eat everything in moderation, and there's a value to that state. Um, uh, they're important as preservatives, um, and I just find it really troubling that because the federal government gives this basic breakdown as to what you're allowed to do that we, we end up with, in my opinion, confusing consumers. The le now, this one and the last one, last one's this real dark one, which I first had a couple years ago when Josh and, um, supplied me with products. Smell this. It smells wicked good. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Here is where someone who has a background in the culinary world. This is the brand, this is part of this, what's happened in this renaissance. Chefs who are interested in playing with flavors and textures and so forth come up with these extraordinary mixtures. This is Josh's mole. And it has chili and chocolate. Cocoa, chipotle chilies, ghost chili, garlic, cloves, and so forth. Ghost chili, oh, just a little bit. Ghost chili, by the way, is very hot. Do you want to let Charles know to come on in because we're going to have to clear this? Questions? We still got about five minutes left. Is there, any, is there any way of curing meat uh, in a reduced sodium kind of way? Yes, there is. That's a fabulous question. So, LaQuercia in Iowa, they found that the prosciuttos that they like were less salty. So what they did um, is they remove a bone, the bone from the inside of the, of the hog's uh, leg. And it, the Italians called this sambato. Remove it, and now I have a, um, essentially like a little envelope, and I can salt inside, so it's also on the flesh, and that means I can use less. Uh, salt is a critically important in this process. Fortunately, it's not potassium, uh, because that's saltpeter, and that was used as a curing agent as well. Often, um, uh, sodium chloride uh, and nitrates are used to, to make sure the color doesn't change. 
as something ages because it turns basically turns gray. Behind you. Uh, I was just wondering if the Mozilla had rosemary in it. Um, it got coriander in it. Maybe that's what you tasted. Um, and it has a smoked paprika in it as well. Again, this to me is an example of how chefs moving into larger production, because essentially at one point all he was doing was selling direct to you and me. And there are, there are, temp, there are exemptions when I'm just selling direct. When I go wholesale, it's a whole different situation. I saw another hand up over here. Go ahead. Um, I came in a little bit late. We might have touched upon this earlier, but I'm just wondering, is there, do you have any recommendations for folks if, if, if they want to like try to do charcuterie at home? Ah, uh, okay. First, thank you. First recommendation, the Italians have this wonderful saying, which I will not try to repeat verbatim, but I will say it in English. The pig bites harder from the grave. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think that means? Longer in ways, the earth the pressure is kind of better? No. It's real exactly hard. the opposite. Mm -hmm. It will kill you. Mm -hmm. And so my first advice to anyone who wants to do charcuterie that is not cooked, <laughs> absolutely essential for hygiene and sanitation and cleanliness. You think you've cleaned it once, you clean it two or three times. Because you and I live in an environment in which listeria is here. It's present. You know, they tell you not to wash your chicken in, a, in your sink. Why not? Because you can spread the stuff that's growing on that bird to other areas of your kitchen. So it, it can be done. I know people who are doing it. There are a ton of great books on how to do this, written by people who basically more than tested the recipes. Um, Michael Ruhlman, there are two or three books that he's done on charcuterie, there are a group of these. And if you're really interested, seek them out. Many of these now, are, you can probably pick up used, um, and they would be a tremendous value to you, uh, whether you're looking at doing salamis or whole, meat, or whole muscle. Other questions in the back, sir? The, uh, I saw a show where they had, they were doing a prosciutto, and they had packed the, uh, the hip in lard. After? They it up to dry for like three to six months. And how is that, okay. that process, and how does it keep it safe? But they start with salt after, because it doesn't, it, the lard, okay, the reason for the lard is to protect it from anything penetrating from the outs from the air. But the salt is fundamental. The lard also helps to retard water evaporation from the muscle. So there are points at which that shows up. And at La Quercia, they actually use this Italian mixture called Suna, which has lard and some other things in it. And it's spread on the outside, especially on the open area, the muscle area and then it hangs for however long they're doing that process. Uh, again, these are techniques that took centuries to figure out. Somebody was the taster somewhere along the line. Uh, the pig bites harder from the grave. It can, you can get really sick from eating tainted meat. Other questions? You have time for like one more question. Sir. Speaking of new techniques, have you heard about using koji or other fungus instead to? Uh... I haven't, uh, but I would not be surprised. Uh, this is part of what's happening today. It's this amazing intersection of all of these techniques, and people are looking for new ideas. Does this work? They're not selling it yet, <laughs> or maybe they are, but it takes time to do this. We are out of time. I will be outside around the corner at the bookstore. If any of you want to pick up a copy um, and talk further, I'm happy to do that. Thank you for your attention. Thank Please you. like it.